It's nice to see that you've all recovered from the exam so well. How many had two cookies? How many had no cookies? That's good. Uh oh, you fail. All right. Today, we're going to go into uh, agonizing detail about what DNA viruses do to elaborate the genetic information that's contained in their genomes. And by that, I mean in particular, how do they transcribe RNA from their um, DNA genomes? And there are a couple of points that are important, and they start with what have viruses taught us? As with everything that um, Dr. Racaniello has told you, viruses, of course, teach us everything. Well, they teach us a lot. But they've yielded some very fundamental information about control signals, and that is how various promoters are used to initiate transcription. And they've told us, informed us about what constitutes a promoter. That is, what are the DNA sequences that are recognized by RNA polymerase, the major um, protein that's involved in generating transcripts, and all of the other ancillary proteins that are very important in separating virus from host promoters. They've told us about what an enhancer is, and we'll get into a little more detail about that later, but an enhancer is a magic sequence. It's something that does just that. It raises the initiation rate of transcription and results in more RNA being transcribed. And there are some very interesting properties of enhancers. They've also told us about introns and exons and why nascent RNA transcripts are bigger than messenger RNAs. And we'll talk a lot about transcripts and we'll talk about messenger RNAs. And it's very important to me that you understand what the difference between those two is. So I will hammer that into your heads until we're all sick of it. And then finally, and perhaps most interestingly, they've told us how RNA synthesis is initiated and regulated. And there are very, very complex and intricate, well-orchestrated ways in which viruses use host proteins and their own to recognize sequences within their genomes to turn things on, to turn things off, and to temporarily regulate. So we'll want to learn about that. So why is transcription important? It's usually one of the first events that follows infection. And it's like that because viruses tend not to carry with them all of the proteins that they need to replicate themselves. <clears throat> the DNA virus chromosomes occur in a variety of templates. And when I say they're chromosome-like, that is, they have some of the properties, but not all of the properties of host chromatin. For example, SV40, a member of the Papoa virus family, and we've talked about that in terms of replication, the actual virus genome is present as a regular array of nucleosomes. That is, the virus DNA is wrapped in that supercoil around host nucleosomes. But what's amazing is that there's a one particular area of that virus genome, the same area that's used to initiate DNA synthesis, the origin of replication, that leaves the virus genome open for transcription. Adenoviruses and herpes viruses, both linear molecules uh, in the virus, have chromatin-like DNA structures, but they're not chromatin per se. Rather, they are decorated with histones and other host proteins when they come into the nucleus of the cell, but they don't um, form a chromatin-like structure. And our friend HIV, which is uh, RNA when it starts, but DNA when it's doing its business, is transcribed from integrated DNA. So that virus RNA genome has been made into a double-stranded DNA template. It is then integrated into the host. And it's from there that new virus genomes and virus transcripts are made. And one of the things that's important is that regulation of expression of virus genetic information is critical. It's a strictly defined series of events that rely on expression of virus genetic information, and availability of host proteins. Now, much like DNA replication, and I'll try and draw the parallels for you so that you can see where they are similar, regulation of transcription is generally controlled by initiation, although there are points where elongation is a rate-limiting step. And in particular, in um, HIV replication, 
there are RNAs that are stalled unless a particular HIV uh, protein is available. And we won't discuss that today. It's a multi-step process, and there are many opportunities for control. Transcription is not just about starting. Like DNA synthesis, you need to form pre-initiation complexes. You have complexes that are called closed and open. You have um, initiation events that are abortive, and so on and so forth. Most of the specificity for transcription, however, resides in initiation. The recognition of, of a precise nucleotide sequence by virus and cell, or just cell in some cases, uh, proteins that allows for transcription of that. Termination is both, uh, occurs when both the polymerase, that's making RNA, and the RNA itself are released from the template. And as with most other um, instances of host RNA transcription, termination results from recognition of a very specific sequence, which is conserved. So, we've told you that the steps are just like DNA replication, that we have promoter recognition, think of that as the origin, we have the formation of a pre-initiation complex, which is where auxiliary proteins recognize a sequence, they bring a polymerase to a site, and they sit there and they prime to initiate. And initiation occurs at a specific site, a demonstrated distance downstream from a particular nucleotide sequence called a TATA box. We then have elongation, extension of the growing RNA chain, and termination. And then there are a series of other events that occur. So what happens to RNA transcripts? What is a transcript? A transcript is an RNA polynucleotide made from a DNA template in the nucleus. It is not a messenger RNA. A messenger RNA only exists in the cytoplasm on a polyribosome. It's not a message until it's bringing a message. Okay? You can have that same sequence in the cytoplasm, but it's not technically a messenger RNA until it's being translated. But in the biogenesis of these RNA transcripts, you have a number of events that occur that ready this transcript for transport from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. So let's just look at them in a little bit of detail. While the RNA is being transcribed, as the 5' prime end is extended and released from the template, it is capped. So this particular moiety, a 7-methyl guanosine phosphate, is placed on the 5' prime end of the RNA. So here's our transcript. It ends here. Usually it would end with a triphosphate, but what you get is this backwards, if you will, sequence. So the base is extended, and now you have a cap. And that cap is a structure which protects the 5' prime end and which is recognized by cap-binding proteins, which facilitate translation. After the RNA reaches a certain point, it gets polyadenylated. And that's a string of polyA moieties that are added to the end of the RNA, and they tend to be important for RNA stability. Many RNAs have introns in them, and they have to get removed. They can be removed during the course of transcription, so that you juxtapose two exons, or they can be removed post-transcription. Some RNAs are edited. The actual nucleotide sequences are changed. This all occurs basically in the nucleus. But then, in order for the RNA to become functional or useful to the DNA um, virus, it has to be transported. It has to get out of the nucleus. And in order to do that, it has to be recognized by some host protein. Or later in the course of a virus life cycle, it can be a viral protein. And these proteins are called exportins. And they export RNA. And they do it in conjunction with um, <coughs> certain host molecules as well. Once out in the cytoplasm, an RNA has a certain functional half-life. It can be translated and made into protein, any one of the numbers of proteins that the virus encodes, or it can decay. So the half-life of that molecule is critical in terms of where it's going. One of the things that we've learned in the, first, in the last few years is that some of these RNAs are silenced. 
and they're either silenced as a result of expression of host microRNAs, small uh, RNAs, or virus RNAs. And these are used to regulate expression of these messages, and they result in either degradation of the message or the inhibition of its translation. There are three polymerases that are known to be used in the biosynthesis of RNA in mammalian cells. One of them is polymerase 1, and this makes uh, ribosomal RNA, and it's not known to be used by viruses per se. It is used to make microRNAs. The other is POL2, which is used to make most RNAs that become messenger RNAs and also some microRNAs. And then there's polymerase 3, which makes a series of molecules, including tRNAs, but in the world of viruses, it makes RNAs such as the VA RNAs of adenovirus, the Ebers of Epstein-Barr virus, and again, some viral microRNAs. And these are all regulatory molecules, RNAs that end up controlling the fate of uh, messages and the production of protein in virus-infected cells. So the real question then becomes, how does the virus subjugate the host? What's better about the virus that makes it attractive to the host replication machinery? So it depends upon what the virus is and how it looks to the host. We've talked a little bit about hepatitis B virus. In order for that to become a functional transcription unit, it has to complete the interrupted strand of DNA. Adenovirus and polyomaviruses just entered the cell. They bring nothing with them. It's a genome. In the case of the polyomaviruses, then there are nucleosomes on it. In the case of adeno, that linear DNA gets coated with host histones, and there's some sort of a structure that's seen and recognized by host transcription apparatus. Herpes viruses, or at least herpes simplex, and a few of the other ones, actually bring something that's encapsidated, uh, that's incorporated in the, in the avirion. So it's not actually in the capsid, but in that layer between the capsid and the envelope called the tegument. And there are virus um, encoded proteins that are present there, and they're very important for initiation of uh, specific genes in herpes virus replication. And retroviruses bring in their own reverse transcriptase, which turns that RNA into a DNA and then allows for production of a protein such as integrase and the incorporation into double-stranded DNA. So why do we regulate synthesis? This says how, but it's just as much a why, and that's to control the timing and abundance of specific virus proteins. Virus proteins that are made very early at very early times in infection are there to upregulate the expression of the virus genome, and at times to initiate or begin the initiation of virus DNA synthesis. So you want those to be made early in infection, not late in infection. You want them there so that you increase the number of virus templates. Why? Because an orderly synthesis allows for specific events. If you want to go through a life cycle and you want to make capsid proteins, the things that protect the genome, you want to do that after you have a genome. And the reason for that is that in most cases, these proteins assemble efficiently and effectively around a genome, although some of them are capable of self-assembly, as Dr. Akinello has told you. The other reason is that some of the gene products, if made in large amounts at the wrong time, turn out to be actually toxic to a cell. If you shut down the cell, the host for the virus, the virus cannot faithfully complete its mission. So it gets interrupted in the course of its replication. And what happens if things go awry? Well, it really depends on the virus. And it's something to think about. But in some instances, when proteins are elaborated at the wrong time, the entire transcriptional program shuts down, and you get what's called an abortive infection, one which starts but doesn't finish its mission. So what are the steps in the transcription of pre-messenger RNA? Much like DNA replication, and think of this as an origin of replication, it's a promoter, the transcriptional machinery of the host recognizes this DNA sequence. And what it starts to do is synthesize very small polynucleotides. And many of these initiation events abort. So they're called abortive initiations. And the polymerase is stalled 
at the initiation site until we believe a bunch of things happen that change the polymerase, change the family of proteins that are present on the promoter. And then it begins to move down the DNA template. And using nucleotide triphosphates, elongation occurs. Elongation is also frequently terminated, and we have bigger abortive transcripts. So this process is not as efficient as one would like it to be, but it seems to work because viruses make lots of copies of themselves. Eventually, the nascent RNAs begin to uh, accumulate, and remember that we have many polymerases along the same genome. So this turkey-like molecule has uh, many in front of it and many, many in front of it and many behind it. And the five prime nascent RNA is spit out. It reaches a point with a defined recognition signal where the RNA synthesis is terminated, and two things happen. The polymerase falls off the DNA template, and the RNA transcript is released. Now, many other things go on, as I alluded to in that uh, second or third slide. During the course of transcription, 7-methyl-GPP is added to the 5' prime terminal terminus of uh, the transcription unit. That's the cap. Exons and introns are both transcribed, and depending upon the particular messenger RNA, there are endonucleolytic events that recognize the beginnings and the ends of introns and result in their removal, splicing. This can occur during transcription or it can occur after transcription is complete and the poly-A moieties are added. The spliced RNAs, and not all viral RNAs are spliced, in fact, many are not spliced. Very different from the host where most are spliced. They're recognized by a series of promoters that are, uh, proteins that are either virus or host coded, and they are pushed out through the nuclear pores using exportins, and they accumulate in the cytoplasm where they can be translated. Sometimes we get viral RNAs that retain introns. Sometimes they're just exon-exon boundaries. And sometimes they have no intervening sequence at all. Two things happen. They either get translated into protein and then degraded, or they can be directly degraded. So what composes or what constitutes the recognition elements for initiation of transcription? Well, we term these core and distal elements. And that refers to, again, DNA recognition sequences that are either close to the start site of transcription, core, or a distal element. And a distal element doesn't mean that it's just upstream. It can also be downstream. <clears throat> These core elements provide information for recognition of the assembly site. And they usually contain this sequence, a tata box, so-called, for its obvious, obvious reasons, its sequence. And that's recognized by a protein, TF2D. And you'll, please don't memorize any of these. What I want you to know is that there's a sequence of events. And these are named so because they come out as column fractions and when they came out on a column. And then sometimes there is a sequence called an initiator, not always, and that specifies absolute accurate starts. And it turns out when you look at the ends, the five prime ends of mammalian cell RNAs or viral RNAs, there's frequently a little bit of play, and they may start at one nucleotide or one that's one upstream or one that's one downstream from that. There are these distal sites that provide sites upstream or downstream for activator proteins, proteins that enhance the initiation event. They enhance it because they're bringing polymerase to the promoter or because they actually um, interact with the polymerase and cause physical changes to the polymerase. And then we have enhancers. And enhancers are these magical sequences that are position and orientation independent. In other words, they can be upstream from the start site, downstream from the start site, and it doesn't matter whether they are in, headed in the same direction as the transcription unit or the opposite direction. That is, if you take that element out of a genome and you put it, say it was upstream, and you put it downstream, it will still function. If you turn it around, it will still function. Sometimes they're tissue specific. Sometimes they're universal. When they're tissue specific, it's because there's a protein that is recognizing that enhancer element that's present only in a particular tissue within the body 
or it can actually be species specific as well. So it can be something that's present in uh, man but not um, other primates. So um, this is a schematic representation of what I've talked about. Plus one always refers to the start site for transcription. And frequently there is an initiator sequence that encompasses the start site or is slightly downstream from it. About 28 base pairs upstream from that start site is this Tata sequence. And this con these elements constitute the core promoter. So if you put those into an in vitro transcription um, assay, they will generate RNA. There are other sequences, though, that are found between 100 and 500, and as many as thousands of base pairs upstream that contain other DNA binding sites or sequences that bind DNA binding proteins, and they control promoter activity or, um, enhance, or allow for the presence of enhancers or silences. So just like elements that activate transcription, there are elements that temper it down, and those are called silencers. And we know less about how they work. So what does a virus DNA genome have to do? It has to enter the nucleus, because that's where the host's transcriptional apparatus lies. The templates and accessory proteins, usually hosts in most cases, are recognized by cell RNA polymerase, and that leads to either early or immediate early gene expression. And those are the proteins, again, that either enhance um, gene expression are involved in DNA replication, and subsequently that allows for late transcription. This template has to produce a structure that's recognizable by the transcription apparatus of the host. That's, that's to generate these early genes. And the purpose of all this is to replicate genomes to increase the template number. So if you come in with one viral genome, you want to make hundreds if you're a virus. You want to make hundreds because you want to make more virus. But in order to make more virus, you have to make more messenger RNA and a lot more protein. And the easiest way to do that and to subjugate the host is to put more of yourself there, increase the template number. And what that does is like, you can think of it as Brownian in motion, but what it does is it offers more opportunity for host RNA polymerases and the transcription um, factories to find these genomes. One of the very curious things that we learn as we go forward and study these events is that despite the fact that you can have hundreds of genomes, only a limited number of them are actually being transcribed. The others are replicated, uh, excuse me, the others are acting as sinks for host proteins that will temper virus transcription. So, what does polymerase II do? It's a very large, complex assembly. The holoenzyme contains a number of different proteins. We're not going to talk about all of them, but we'll give you a picture and an idea of what they are. They specify accurate initiation of RNA transcripts. They recognize the promoter, but they usually do it in response to host and virus proteins. So isolated RNA polymerase by itself can initiate transcription, but not as efficiently as, what's in the pre as when it's in the presence of these other accessory molecules. And they synthesize RNA transcripts. They do it by recognition of that core promoter element, that small box that contains the Tata sequence and the 5 prime end for initiation. First, by formation of a stable closed initiation complex. And that locks the polymerase in place on the DNA templates, template. Then you form an open initiation complex. And just like DNA replication, you have a helix to open. In order to generate messenger RNA, uh, excuse me, transcripts, you've got to be able to read through the DNA. And then what happens is after you generate this initiation complex, the polymerase actually escapes from the promoter. It begins to move downstream. And that happens because there's a change, a physical change to polymerase II that results from phosphorylation of its carboxy terminus. And that's done in a variety of ways. Once promoter clearance has been obtained, the molecules elongate, they get bigger, and you get movement of the polymerase complex. 
This is different from DNA replication, where the complex stays. So, there's an order of binding. Again, sort of think about what occurs, don't remember what the various names are. Here's our core promoter, here's our start for site for transcription, and the TATA box. And this large complex of proteins called TF2D, TATA binding factor plus transcription associated factors, binds and bends DNA. So there's actually a physical change in the structure of the DNA. All right, TATA binding protein recognizes the TATA box through the initiator. So there's coordination between these two sequences. And then another protein enters. TF2A also enters into this complex, and that facilitates the binding. Whoops. Then we have TF2F, which delivers RNA polymerase. So when this protein comes in, it allows RNA polymerase, this turkey over here, to be right next to this turkey over here. And what you realize now is that you have a lot of proteins. In fact, you have nine proteins with ATPase and helicase activity. The ATPase is to generate energy for the helicase to unwind the template to allow the polymerase to begin to um, form this closed RNA initiation complex. You now have all of these proteins arrayed and juxtaposed to one another, and it's now primed on the promoter as a closed initiation complex. You then have to begin the initiation pro uh, program. So after recognition and assembly, we bend the DNA, we unwind the helix, the polymerase remains in contact with the promoter, and then it begins to incorporate nucleoside triphosphates and begins to produce RNA. Sometimes there are abortive transcripts, and sometimes we get, <coughs> we get things that move on down through the template. Finally, when this opens, you get release from the promoter. So that allows this assembly, the polymerase assembly, not the initiator assembly, to move down the polymerase, uh, down the template. This, all right, the initiation moieties, if you will, remain bound to the DNA, and they allow for new polymerase molecules to now be added at the initiation site. There are a bunch of assays that are used for promoter activity, and I'm going to show you um, some of the good things and some of the bad things about them. There's something called a runoff assay, and that's done in a test tube. There is pulse labeling, where one incorporates radioactive um, nucleotides into growing RNA chains, and that's really the only thing that measures um, promoter activity or absolute strength. The others are all um, synthetic, if you will. And there are reporter assays that use molecules whose um, product we can measure very easily because it emits light or because it has an enzymatic activity. And we quantitate the amount of that product that's made, and we say that that is a reflection of the promoter activity. What it is is a reflection of the amount of messenger RNA that accumulates, and it doesn't account for a lot of things, but it's, it's usually a pretty good approximation. So what's a... Um, What's the in vitro assay like? What happens is we take a DNA template that contains our promoter of interest, usually one that has been cloned and amplified in a plasmid, and then we'll linear, linearize that plasmid. So we take the circular molecule, we make it linear, and we make it rather short, usually on the order of about 100 base pairs. And we allow that piece of DNA, we introduce that piece of DNA into a test tube with our transcription apparatus, and radioactive nucleotide tri triphosphates. We let this reaction go on for a little while, and we measure the amount of unit length RNA that's made. And we can see it because it incorporates radioactive nucleotides, and this is a representation of that. So that's done in vitro, but that's done outside of all of the structural apparatus that's present inside of a cell. So just like DNA replication occurs at specific sites, in the nucleus, so does transcription. The reporter assay involves fusing a coding sequence of interest, in this case, Firefly luciferase, 
behind a promoter of interest, and we can change this promoter. And then we transform this DNA into a cell where it can be transiently expressed. One of the problems with this assay is that you get thousands, if not millions, of copies of DNA present inside of a cell that takes up these DNAs. And then after a period of time, we make an extract, and we add luciferin and ATP, and we measure luciferase assay, and we ask, does promoter A make more luciferase than promoter B, or what? And this, of course, is subject to other interpretations as well. But these are ready assays that are easily done in a laboratory, and they tend to give us, they at least inform us in one direction or another. Now, there are lots of different ways of regulating transcription. One way, and perhaps the most important, is to regulate abundance, that is the sheer amount of a specific RNA that accumulates, through initiation. You can regulate transcription by the availability of the template. And some parts of a DNA template are available all, at all times, and other parts are not. They're either occluded by host proteins or by some structural elements. Sometimes the coactivators, the things that bring the polymerase to the promoter, are decorated. That is, they have other moieties that are added to them, and they can be phosphorylation events, methylation events, acetylation events, or ADP ribosylation. And we know that the role of enhances can change the rate of initiation. What's splicing? Let's just be clear about where it came from and why it's important in uh, regulating control of virus RNA. Early in the, or late in the 60s, there were experiments done that compared the size of RNA that was present in the nucleus of a mammalian cell to the size of the RNAs that accumulated in the cytoplasm, with the exception of the ribosomal units. And what they found was that nuclear RNA, also known as heterogeneous nuclear RNAs, were much, much larger than the messenger RNAs that accumulated. And it was tough to figure out why, and there was a whole bunch of stuff that went on for years and years and years. And we didn't know what it was. But what we knew was that these heterogeneous nuclear RNAs had both five prime caps and three prime polyacides. So they looked just like what accumulated in the cytoplasm and became translated. They looked like they were going to be messengers. The early hints that this was not true came from studies of adenovirus late RNAs. <clears throat> and what they found was that there were eight, seven or eight different late RNAs that are used to generate the capsid structure of the virion. And they all had the same nucleotide sequence at the five prime end. The question became, how and why? And it turns out that all of these late RNAs have four parts. One part, which is three parts at one, is a five prime terminal tripartite leader. And we'll explain what that is in a couple of minutes. And the second part is the body, that is the part that actually encodes the protein of interest. So four parts, the five prime terminal tripart leader, and the body. So how do you get small RNAs from big RNAs? You do it through splicing. Now this is an adenovirus transcription map. And what's um, important for me to tell you about is that there is one transcription unit very close to the origin region of DNA synthesis called E1A that is recognized by host proteins and host proteins alone. And it contains an enhancer. And that's the first RNA that's transcribed from adenovirus DNA. And it is absolutely essential because what it does is it activates transcription of E2, an early gene product. So this is an immediate early gene product in E2. And E2 begins to start the DNA replication cycle. And that allows for the synthesis of late RNAs. So why is, why is this different? There's a promoter in the middle of the adenovirus chromosome called the major late promoter. At very, very early times post-infection, a single very long RNA is made from this. And sometimes a short RNA is made for it. In other words, the promoter is active, but no late gene products accumulate. 
after a period of time, this gene, 4A2, which is made after DNA synthesis, is uh, a, a protein is, is uh, translated from this RNA, and that activates this major late promoter. And what happens now is that the transcription units begin to assemble in a much more uh, cohesive manner. We don't really understand this, but various portions of the major late promoter region are transcribed. So we have what's called um, L1, L2, and L3. And they are separated by RNA that is removed. So these are functional equivalents of exons, although they don't encode any protein. And these are intervening sequences that are removed from them. So this is the tripartite leader. And this is an important uh, sequence because it's used to help translate late messenger RNAs. The three prime end of, whoops, the three prime end of L3 is then spliced to various acceptor sequences throughout the very large messenger RNA to generate individual RNA transcripts. And we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail. How do we know this is actually true? I told you before that all of the late transcripts, so if you isolated RNAs for L2 or L3, hexon or core proteins, and you asked what does their five prime end look like, they would all look the same. So this undecanucleotide was conserved. How could that be derived? Well, when they looked at the sequence of adenovirus, what they saw was that these sequences were incorporated within this tripartite leader. And what this is a picture of is a DNA-RNA uh, hybrid. And what they've done is take a single strand of adenovirus DNA in blue and annealed it to hexon messenger RNA. And what they see is, and let's look at the back end of the molecule, this represents double-stranded RNA-DNA duplex. So a portion of it is linear, collinear, and forms a hybrid. But the very five prime end contains little areas, one, two, and three of duplex, and areas of DNA that are extended from the template. And they're extended because they don't hybridize with the RNA. There's no RNA there, so they've been removed. So the tripartite leader is contained within sequences one, two, and three, and the sequences between them and the body of whatever RNA it, it is are looped out. And that's how we knew. And that was the first evidence that these things were spliced, and three people were accorded Nobel Prizes based on this work. So splicing is value added. We've talked about how um, virus genomes conserve genetic information. And here we have transcripts conserving ge genetic information because depending upon where they're spliced, you get a different protein that um, resolves from it. So splicing occurs without loss of coding information. It's very economical. You can splice at different sites within the same transcripts and generate multiple RNAs that will change the coded product of that RNA. So alternative splicing, that is the use of different acceptors and donors, creates new functional genes by rearrangement of exons and thus expands the coding information of a small virus genome. So now let's look in a little bit more detail at what goes on in ADNO. Here's that major late transcript, and here are five different potential coding regions. And you can see that they are generated from this transcript by the, the splice donor here at the end of uh, this sequence joining an acceptor somewhere downstream to generate L1, L1 and L2, L3, or what have you. And depending upon where the splices occur, you get different families of RNA. In fact, sometimes the splices occur within genes. And again, you get different proteins made as a result of that. And those proteins may be collinear, and they may diverge over uh, portions of that message. And we'll show you an example of that when we talk about E1A. HIV generates its very important regulatory proteins all as a result of splicing. And its splicing is controlled in part by some of its own proteins. They control elongation of transcription from viral DNA that's um, 
incorporated into the, integrated into the genome, and they also control where and when splicing occurs. Remember that with a retrovirus, you have to make a full-length RNA transcript in order to generate a genome. You also have to make partial-length transcripts to make the various proteins. <coughs> so um, let's go back to SV40. We learned all about how it replicates its DNA, and the nice thing about it is that the same sequence that's important for initiation of DNA, sequ uh, DNA synthesis is also important for the initiation of early transcription and the resulting synthesis of T antigen. The SV40 genome contains the molecule called an enhancer. It was the first enhancer that was ever described, and it's a duplicated 72 base pair sequence. And as I said before, it's a sequence that works at a distance, or it can. It's orientation independent, and it can work in trans. It doesn't have to be physically linked to the sequence that's being transcribed. And if you look at it schematically, this is the SV40 origin of DNA replication area. It's that open, non-chromatinized area of the uh, supercoiled molecule. Here is the early transcription start site. And this sequence serves as the enhancer sequence, which binds a whole bunch of host proteins. And they work in conjunction with host RNA polymerase to initiate transcription of uh, early RNA. How do enhancers work? Well, this is what we think. They're either upstream or downstream. In some cases, they can be 90,000 base pairs away from the promoter. But what they do is they actually recognize sequences within the initiation complex, and these proteins bend DNA and bind to it. And what they do is they increase the affinity of RNA polymerase for these sites, and ergo, they increase initiation. How do we know they work in trans? And this is a very clever experiment where a piece of DNA that contained the core sequence was isolated by restriction endonuclease digestion. So we have a definite end and we have our start site. And the relative transcription of this in an in vitro assay, assay was measured. And that's one. When you add the enhancers, you get 100 times that amount of transcription. If you digest that sequence that contains the enhancer and add a biotin moiety to the end, biotin is this sticky substance, then you go back to one. So if these two pieces of DNA are not together or not able to find each other is a better case, then what happens is it's the same as having only the core sequence. Now, you can physically join them, but prevent movement of anything by adding a molecule called streptavidin, which is, uh, has tremendous avidity for biotin. And now you form this structure where you have physically linked the two pieces of DNA, but no molecule can go from here to here. So it can't go down the railway tra track, but it can cross the railway tracks. And when you put these things together in this uh, composition, then you restore about 60% of the activity. And what that tells you is that the enhancer activity can work trans to the actual molecule because it can't transmit a signal through the um, bound moiety. Now, how is transcription regulated by host proteins? Viruses use the host or virus-specified proteins to regulate expression. They either encode them, and they encode them very early in the infection process, or they bring them in with coactivating molecules. Be when you bring a molecule in, then you limit its, ex its accessibility to DNA in general on the basis of what kind of cell type it's in. So cell type specificity can limit expression. And as I said before, for the case of enhancers, which recognize certain host proteins, these molecules can be organ or species specific. So an enhancer from a mouse may or may not work in a human cell, and vice versa. What are the regulatory protein domains that are present in some of these activator molecules? Well, most of these mo regulatory molecules are composed of multiple domains. They're not simple 
one-shot um, proteins. And they contribute to virus DNA uh, transcriptional regulation in many ways. Some of them are DNA binding motifs. And some of these are called zinc fingers, helix turn helix motifs, or basic residues. Some of these proteins have activator or repressor uh, activities. That is, things that turn up transcription or turn it down. And they usually do these through acidic domains, things that are glutamine rich, proline rich, rich or isoleucine rich. And more often than not, these regulatory molecules don't function as um, unimolecular species. Rather, they're dimers or trimers. In the case of T antigen, it's a hexamer. So they multimerize. And these sequences not only can bring together uh, the virus proteins, but they can help them interact with other proteins. What are some of the virus transcriptional activators that we should know a little bit about? Um, some are autoregulatory molecules, such as SV40 T antigen. After you synthesize T antigen, it goes back, it sits at the site of initiation of transcription and DNA replication in this case, and it actually downregulates expression of itself. Too much T is apparently not a good thing. Herpes simplex virus produces a major immediate early protein called ICP4 that activates gene expression of the bulk of uh, the transcription units in the virus, but turns its own self off. So it's autoregulatory. Some of these regulatory molecules bind DNA. T antigen, ICP4, the E2 protein from papillomavirus that we talked about, and the Epstein-Barr virus nucleantigen, which is important in regulation of Epstein-Barr virus. Some of them bind host proteins. So herpes simplex virus brings in with the infectious uh, virus particle a protein called VP16. That's the protein that's present in the tegument. And it works through a variety of host proteins to activate immediate early gene expression. And we'll go through that in some detail. And some liberate host transcriptional activators. Just like T antigen is important in releasing the host from cell cycle uh, constraints, it's also important for releasing host transcriptional proteins. And SV40T does this, adenovirus E1 does this, and papillomavirus E7 do it. And they all do it on the same protein. And they all do it in slightly different ways. And that protein is RB for the retinoblastoma protein. It's an important tumor suppressor and a regulator of cell cycle. But what RB does is it captures a host protein called E2F and sequesters it. So when that is released, it's now available for transcription from the virus genome. These proteins all interact with polymerase II, and their purpose is to establish a regulatory circuit, both positive autoregulatory loops that alter the rate of transcriptional initiation, and virus proteins can stimulate this, and negative autoregulatory loops that repress gene expression. We don't really understand this in great detail. We believe that it's a result of the proteins actually physically and strongly binding to the DNA and preventing uh, promoter clearance. But the most important thing they do is initiate transcriptional cascades. And for almost all viruses that we have studied, transcriptional units are activated in a fixed sequence. So you have one family of genes that's turned on, a second family of genes that's turned on later, and a third family of genes that's turned on uh, after DNA replication. So if you look at the positive and negative order regulatory loops, we look at our gene, gene X, and it gets transcribed and it makes protein X. Protein X can do one of two things. It can go back and sit on this promoter and dampen expression, dampen transcription from that gene. Or it can go back and it can actually activate transcription. So those are positive and negative autoregulatory loops by a production of that protein. The other thing that these proteins can do is to initiate a cascade of reg regulation. Gene X, in this case, is recognized by cellular components. Viral RNA is made. The protein is then expressed. It goes back into the nucleus. And instead of sitting down on itself, it recognizes other promoters, gene Y, gene Z, what have you, and it activates their transcription. Normally, this gene is silent, and it's silent until this protein is made. 
but activation of this regulatory cascade turns this gene on. And that differentiates an immediate early gene, one that's made right after virus infection, from an early gene, one that's made as a result of expression of a virus um, protein. These transcriptional cascades allow for transcription of viral genes in a reproducible and temporally controlled manner. Gene X is made, a period of time goes by, gene Y is made, another period of time goes by, DNA replication ensues. We've differentiated between immediate early and early proteins, and then we have transcription of late genes. Some late genes are made at the beginning of DNA replication, some of them are made at the end of DNA replication. In most cases, we don't know what separates those two events. But this transcriptional cascade ensures coordinated production of DNA genomes, structural proteins so you can make infectious virus, and what it does is freeze templates from repressors. As I said before, when you make lots of DNA molecules and you have lots of genomes present in a cell, any host proteins that are there to repress the virus, or, or adventitiously repressed, because they're not really there to do that, are now soaked up by all these genomes. And so now you free the virus promoters for their transcription. And activating proteins can induce transcription of both host and viral genes, and sometimes you need to turn on something that the host makes as well and repress transcription of their own genes. So let's look at three different paradigms for this. We've discussed SV40 in a little bit of detail, and what I've told you is that at that origin of DNA replication, you have an early transcription unit, and that encodes large T antigen. Once T is made, you dampen expression from the early promoter, and you activate expression from the late. And We believe that's via an anti-repression mechanism. <clears throat> With adenovirus, we first make an immediate early protein, E1A, and that interacts with host proteins to release a transcriptional protein called E2F, which allows for transcription of E2. E2 is a, um, a DNA polymerase single-stranded DNA binding protein series of molecules, and they result in uh, synthesis of adenovirus DNA, anti-repression of that major late promote, promoter, activation of 4A2, and late transcripts. And herpes does it a little bit differently. It carries in, in with it, in the virion, this molecule VP16. And that recognizes, in concert with a series of host proteins, which we'll talk about, immediate early gene promoters. All immediate early gene promoters carry a common um, uh, decanucleotide re, uh, sequence, and that's recognized in concert with a host. And that results in expression of a couple of immediate early proteins. One, this ICP4, which can both um, negatively and positively regulate gene expression. And one, ICP0, which is a promiscuous transcriptional activator. This protein will activate almost any promoter known to man. So it's a very efficient molecule in turning on genes. And these activate the early cascade. And again, we make replication proteins, we make DNA we go into the late phase. Talking about the complexity of these units, we see that SV40 is a very small genome. It has two transcription units, an early and a late. They make six proteins. It heavily relies on the host to initiate transcription and DNA replication, and splicing generates all of the RNAs that are found um, in SV40 infected cells. Adenovirus is considerably larger. It has eight transcription units that encode 40 proteins. And you'll recall that these, a large number of these proteins are derived as a result of splicing. From that large single messenger RNA, you make multiple transcripts. Herpes virus is considerably larger. It has 80 transcript units, and they encode more proteins. And so the layers of complexity are greater and greater. The one thing that all of these things have in common is that the promoters that are used for the very first events after, after introduction into the nucleus and immediate early gene expression, or in the case of SV40 early, are very complicated. They contain multiple sites for binding of host proteins. And 
the reason for that should be pretty obvious. What that does is it allows them access to virtually any cell type. It allows them to use many different kinds of activating molecules that may be present in the liver, but not in the heart, in the brain, but not in the spleen. So it adds diversity to the ability of these viruses to transcribe. And as I said before, some of these transcriptional activators autoregulate and others just activate. Here's a picture of SV40 so you can think about it in a little more detail. And these are differentiates between the early units, which makes two proteins, large T and small t, and the late unit that makes structural elements, parts of the virion. And you'll see they're all made from the same sequence, and they're all derived as a result of splicing to make various length proteins. And in some cases, they actually overlap but encode different proteins. So the sequence for VP1 and VP3 is the same. It's the reading frame that's different. How does T work? Again, it binds to the origin as a hexamer. That results in dampening the early promoter and activating the late promoter so that early transcripts are decreased relative to late. And you need more and more of that because you only need a certain amount of protein to make new DNA molecules, but you need lots of protein to make new virions. Let's just buzz through that. Adenovirus is a bit different. There are three virus proteins and DNA synthesis that govern, govern the phase transitions. The, the immediate early gene synthesis, the early gene synthesis, and the late. E1A is necessary for transcription of all early transcription units. And it's necessary because of its interaction with RB. E2 is required for DNA synthesis, and that's the early gene product. And that's important because without it, you don't enter into the late transcription phase, which increases initiation from the major late promoter. And 4A2 is a late protein which enhances late gene transcription. So it's made very early on after DNA replication, and it enhances gene transcription. So I've highlighted these in red. E1A comes first. Transcription unit E1B follows it very shortly afterwards. But E1A <coughs> expression results in activation of the E2E promoter. And when E2E is made, you make DNA binding protein, preterminal protein, and polymerase. And then you get DNA replication, and you activate 4A2 and the major late promoter. So those are the adenovirus transcription units. E1A is actually a family of gene transcripts. And because of differential splicing, you get two different protein products out of them. One, which is 289 uh, amino acids, and one, which is 243. They use the same splice acceptor, so the C-terminus, is composed of the same sequences, but they differ in terms of their spliced donor. So the large protein contains this moiety, CR3, which is important for stimulating early gene transcription. And both the large and the small moiety have sites that bind host proteins, RB, and another transcriptional regula pro regulatory protein called P300. These proteins don't bind to DNA, but they do bind various host activating factors. And one of these, called mediator 23, binds and assembles RNA polymerase in the initiation complex. So this protein stimulates initiation, and it does it um, in an indirect manner via um, its interaction with E1A. But it also um, works to release E2F, which is bound by RB. So in a normal adenovirus promoter, you have E2F, which recognizes DNA bound on that promoter, but covered with RB. When E1A comes along, it releases RB from that complex. So it takes the RB off and allows E2F now to be seen. E2F works to bring RNA polymerase to the site and to activate the promoter. So it takes the promoter from being turned off, repressed by a host protein, to being activated. And it does it by 
stripping RB and allowing E2F to remain bound to DNA. Now for something incredibly simple. This is the herpes simplex virus replication cycle. And what I'd like to point out to you is the events that occur and tell you in a little more detail about some of them. So here's our virus. It's got this beautiful uh, envelope around a tegument, around a capsid, around its DNA. <coughs> it binds to specific receptors, and then it disgorges these proteins into the cytoplasm. One of them is responsible for shutting off the host, and we won't go into how it does that. But the other is this guy, VP16. And as the capsid is finding its way along um, actin and dynamin uh, filaments to the nucleus, and extruding its DNA, circularizing it, as you'll recall, VP16 is interacting with a host protein called HCF, and that allows it to get to the nucleus. VP16 is not, per se, a DNA binding protein. But once it, in conjunction with these other host proteins, get together, they recognize sites on virus DNA that encode five immediate early uh, gene products, and that activates their transcription. Transcripts go out into the cytoplasm, they're made. The proteins come back, and these proteins are responsible for initiating, um, uh, excuse me, for activating the early replication cycle. They go back out into the cytoplasm, these are termed beta proteins, or early proteins. They come into the nucleus, and they begin to replicate DNA. It's a DNA polymerase and all of those accessory proteins that we talked about last week. New transcripts are made from this concatomeric DNA, and they go again out into the, uh, excuse me, new transcripts are made, they go out into the cytoplasm, and these encode predominantly structural proteins and glycoproteins. Glycoproteins remain in the cytoplasm, the structural proteins go into the nucleus where they assemble around viral DNA, and then the virus buds once from the nucleus where it attains a nuclear envelope, then it de-envelops and goes back out into the cytoplasm, and it re-envelops and buds from the uh, host. So it's a very complex picture, but what's important is that as it goes back out from the nucleus, it gains a tegument again. And so this particle that came in is captured as this thing buds out of the nucleus and uh, is now available in infectious particles. Replication cycle is initiated by V6, VP16. It activates immediate early transcription. These proteins control transcription from all virus genes. If you destroy their activity during the course of virus infection, you stop transcription. <coughs> their expression leads to early gene synthesis and DNA synthesis, then expression of delayed late and late genes and these are dependent on DNA replication. We package VP16 into the new virions, and we start the cycle all over again. And this whole thing can be summarized by saying that there is coordinate regulation of virus gene expression in a temporal fashion. A follows B follows C. What is VP16? It's a protein. It has a potent C-terminal acidic activator. It does not bind DNA but it only works when the promoter of interest contains this DNA sequence called a Tatkarat motif. And this motif is present in herpes simplex virus immediate early promoters. It associates when it comes into the cell in the cytoplasm with something called HCF, host cell factor. It's very interesting that in neurons, and we'll talk about this again later in the course, where the virus tends to go latent, or frequently goes latent, HCF is not present in the cytoplasm. It's only in the nucleus. And so VP16 can't associate with it when it infects a neuron. And there are other physical obstacles to that. And the other protein that it interacts with is OCT1. And these two proteins provide specificity for the promoter. When this tripartite... Um, moiety is on DNA, it stimulates initiation and elongation of transcription, and this is specific for immediate early promoters. So here's what goes on. The virus DNA contains this 
sequence, the tat garat sequence. The five prime portion of it is termed an octamer sequence and a garat motif. The protein OCT1 cell protein recognizes the octamer sequence and it binds DNA. So this is a DNA recognition sequence. VP16 is bound to HCF. Once it binds, then we have a conformational change. <coughs> and these proteins can now sit down next to OCT1, recognizing this sequence. And this changes, physically changes and bends the DNA, the DNA allowing, once again, for initiation of transcription, promoter recognition. So you now have a quaternary complex that's formed as a result of recognition of a viral DNA motif by two host proteins in, in, <clears throat> in conjunction with a virus protein. <clears throat> now, as I said to you at the beginning of the lecture, a primary transcript does not become a messenger RNA until it's ex exported. <clears throat> Export is usually accomplished by a, whoops, it's not happening. <laughs> Export is usually accomplished by host proteins and the transport uses, and the transcript uses nuclear pores to exit. A protein complex that marks mature RNAs for export from the nucleus is assembled during splicing. So this is an active event specific signals are recognized within RNA by host and or viral proteins and this allows for tagging the molecule for bringing it out into the cytoplasm. These, ex <clears throat> these exportins, the host proteins or the viral protein, shuttle between the nucleus. So they're used catalytically. They go back and forth and they carry their cargo um, from the nucleus into the cytoplasm where they're released and then translated. There are many RNAs that are not spliced in virus-infected cells. Retroviruses, herpes viruses, orthomyxoviruses produce unspliced RNAs, and they too are exported for translation uh, or virion assembly. And one of the examples of this is a uh, herpes virus protein called ICP27, and it acts as a Sharon to ferry most virus messenger RNAs across the nucleus because most of them are not spliced. So they're not seen as bodafide structures by the host mechanism. And how do we uh, know this? Well, we know what about this protein is that it's a nuclear phosphoprotein. It has a nuclear export signal, so it can be taken out of the nucleus. So that tells you that these proteins need that. It has a nuclear localization signal, so it can go back into the nucleus. And it has two regions that bind RNA. It happens to have other um, features that are important virus expression, and it's required for polyadenylation of virus messages. But for this purpose, we want to talk about shuttling. The movement from the nucleus, grabbing an RNA that doesn't have an inter intervening sequence in it, so it hasn't been marked and bringing it into the cytoplasm. So how do we know it does it? If we look at this picture, this is a picture of cells that have been infected with a virus that expresses a protein that's temperature sensitive. So at um, the elevated temperature, the protein is made and accumulates only in the nucleus. And it never leaves the nucleus. It's recognizing RNA, but it's not moving out because it can't physically do it. When you raise the temperature, you see that these little dots that were all nuclear now expand into the cytoplasm. You can see a dull green haze around it. So these guys can now, excuse me, when we lower the temperature, these guys can now move from the nucleus back out into the cytoplasm. They then get shuttled back into the um, nucleus and reutilized to export more RNAs. And finally, I just want to um, emphasize something about late gene expression. Sometimes DNA replication is sufficient. Sometimes it's just enough to activate the promoters, and we see that with SV40. In the case of adenovirus, this gene product 4A is transcribed because viral DNA synthesis titrates at a repressor.
Again, lots of genomes. You take away the host's ability to turn things down. And then this protein cooperates with another viral protein to stimulate transcription from the ma major late promoter. And you get these long transcripts that can uh, generate um, capsid proteins. So what do you need to take away from today's lesson? Transcription is complicated. All right, there are lots of ways of starting the molecule. There are lots of sequences that are important. There are lots of host proteins. There are virus proteins. They interact with each other, and they like to do that. And they like to do it because they want to get things started. Control is it at many levels, not just at starting the first family of transcription units, but the later families. And sometimes they depend upon uh, expression of gene products and or DNA replication. There are always host proteins that are involved, and they help regulate transcription. And in almost every case that we know about, virus gene expression is coordinately regulated in a temporal manner. Thank you.